Today's video is really important to everybody, BMS companies, mechanical consultancies, mechanical contractors, facility managers, building owners, energy efficiency specialists. Anybody that lives and works in big cities around the world where the commercial offices are not fully occupied. So some of the flaws, the tenancies have been shut down and those people are working from home. Let's get into it. In winter, um, the length of these videos is not determined by the story, but for how long this room will stay warm after I've turned off that fan heater. So it's a bit of a rush as I go, it gets colder and colder and colder. Um, okay, let's start. Um, let's have a quick summary of how outside air ventilation works. It's obviously relevant to how many floors are occupied or not occupied, or how many people there are here in the building. So if we have a 30 story commercial office and there's 15 floors in the high rise and 15 floors in the low rise, how it tends to work in Australia is for the low rise in the plant room, we normally have about six air handler units. And these six AHUs blow down the 15 floors. So there's the north AHU, south, east, west AHUs, and the two internal AHUs, six AHUs blowing down. We do not tend to have AHUs on every floor. We have it blowing down like this. So during the design phase, the mechanical consultant will work out how many people there are in the 15 floors. Usually one person per 10 meters squared, for example. They work that out, how many people there are, and they multiply each person by a design outside air rate per person. Let's say 10 liters per second. And that allows them to calculate how much outside air we need to bring into the building when the building is fully occupied or the low rise, the 15 floors is fully occupied. So let's say for example, our six AHUs, that each of them has a design outside air rate of 2000 liters per second and a minimum outside air rate of 1000 liters per second. So when the building is, when the low rise is fully occupied, one person per 10 meters squared, and we have quite a high CO2 reading. So the BMS, you know, reads all the CO2 sensors. It's, you know, 800 parts per million or higher. The BMS thinks, okay, this building is, is quite high CO2. It's probably fully occupied, one person per 10 meters squared. So all six AHUs, the outside air dampers modulate open to bring in 2,000 liters per second each. I'm just making these numbers up. I don't know what the real numbers are, 2,000 coming in. And then if half the people work from home, then the BMS sees that the, the CO2 readings are generally lower. Let's say you know 600 parts per million or 650 parts per million. So the BMS says, okay, look, we've got low CO2. Um, we probably do not have a fully loaded 15 floor low rise. So we can reduce the AHUs outside their dampers and each of the six AHUs the outside dampers back off down to 1,000 liters per second each. That's how demand control ventilation works. It's important because in summer, and we have hot air coming into the building, if we reduce the hot air coming into the building, we can save energy in our chillers. They've got less cooling work to do. And in winter, when it's cold outside, if we can draw in less outside air, then we would use less gas heating up that cold air coming into the 15 floors, or both rises. Children boilers are the whole building. So from a point of demand control ventilation and the current situation in our big cities where people are working from home, that makes sense, doesn't it? That's exactly what demand control ventilation is. Half the people or more are working from home, they're not in the office, the CO2 is lower, less outside air. So at a high level, it seems to us like it's working but it's not working because this is what's happening. We don't have a reduced occupancy across the whole low rise. What we have is whole floors are turned off. So let's say in the 15 floors, let's say five floors are shut off. 
So across those five floors in the low rise, there's two or three tenancies. And those companies have shut those floors down because their staff is working from home. So for example, my wife works for a big global software company. Um, they have two beautiful brand new floors in the city. And for the last 18 months, they've not been there. Time schedules off, core dampers shut, VAV shut, the, her two floors completely isolated. So here's the problem. When we have a 15 story low rise with five floors turned off and 10 floors open, our air conditioning control system for you know comfort control can adapt to that. So what happens is as we shut off the five floors, the duct pressure goes up, the, the six AHUs, their supply fans slow down, the return fans slow down, and they control to pressure. So that from a pressure point of view, we've dealt with five floors closing. And probably from a thermal control point of view, maybe we have less demand for cooling or heating. So as those five floors closed off, the heating and cooling valves, they backed off a little bit and we, you know, we had less cooling or less heating. So we've, we've dealt with those five floors turning off pressure and temperature. However, here's the problem and the purpose for this video. The six AHUs, we don't change the 2000 liters per second max limit and the 1000 liters per second minimum limit. So what happens is even though the CO2 might be lower in the 10 floors, let's say it is, that's lower. So the six AHUs reduce the outside air from 2000 to 1000, tick in the box. However, that 1000 is the minimum liters per second for 15 floors, not for 10 floors. And that's what the problem is. So in all of our big cities around the world, where we have tenancies that are shut off, floors that are shut off, our air hailing units are still delivering the design outside air for the whole building or the whole rise, which it shouldn't. So in the perfect world, what would happen is all six AHUs are, have a design of 2000 and a minimum of 1000, all six of them. As we turn one floor off, time schedule off, core dampers closed, VAVs closed, the BMS should reduce the 2000 and the 1000 down a little bit. Shut off a second floor, third floor, fourth floor, fifth floor. So we should be delivering our demand control ventilation control strategy. We should be resetting the max design limit and the minimum design limit up and down, depending on how many floors are occupied. Because right now what's happening is we are massively oversupplying outside air to our buildings if we have floors that are turned off. So I sort of realized this last year, we're doing witnessing and we were going through the testing and I was shutting floors off, shutting floors off, shutting floors off, just simulating this in my head through witnessing on a new construction job. And I realized that as I was shutting floors off, you know, pressure and temperature was adapting, but outside air was still full design. Because if you think about it, just slightly exaggerating it, in the 10 floors that have opened, if one of those floors is actually fully loaded and its CO2 is 800 parts per million on that one floor, all six AHUs will drive into full design outside air, 2000 years per second, and there's five floors that are shut down. So it's gonna be a massive oversupply. So getting back to what I just said a second ago, last year I was, I discovered this while witnessing and I thought, look, this is a bit of a problem, but I'm just gonna ignore it for a minute. I didn't defect, I just ignored it. But we are now in year two of COVID, working from home, lots of floors shut down. So this is the second year we're in now. We're almost definitely gonna go into a third year of reduced occupancy in our big cities and our big offices, a third year for sure. But here's the thing that I'm sort of worried about, is even when we get through this drama we have right now, not everyone's gonna come back to the office. So my wife and her two floors, I don't think they're going back. They are very happy working in the lounge. So this is a long-term problem. It's not just 
let's ignore it while COVID's here. After COVID, there'll still be more years where we're gonna have in every single building, in the low rise and the high rise, two floors shut down. One or two floors shut down. That building, that building, that building. So for the next, I don't know, let's say five years, we're not gonna have fully loaded offices, I don't think, just guessing, which means that we're gonna be permanently oversupplying outside air that we don't need to. So if we adjust our control strategy, which is quite simple, if this floor's on, the max and minimum, add it to the AHU. Second floor on, add it. Third floor on, add it. The software program is quite easy to adapt and the mechanical engineers, they already know how many people there are on the floors. We just need them to break up their calculations a bit differently. So for the North Air Handling Unit, 15 floors. What's the min max for the North? Level one, two, three, four. When you add those all up, they come to 2,000 and 1,000 outside requirements. The South AHU, the East AHU, the West AHU. Mechanical engineer, please tell us, as a floor gets enabled, how much design outside air and minimum outside air do we add to each of the six AHUs? That's not hard to do that. They know that. It's got to re-crunch the numbers. So that can be fixed quite easily. I don't know if that's going to work. I just needed to take a minute to get my thoughts together and I wanted to stop the recording, so I'm going to try and do that. We'll both find out if that worked or if it was dumb, I don't know. So to start wrapping things up, a lot of you might be thinking, look, Bryce, yeah, like that makes, that makes sense, it's quite interesting, but we don't care. And a lot of you um, work in countries or live in countries where buildings energy efficiency ratings and energy efficiency are not important. Like, I get that. That is not important in some countries. But, the, but I want you to think about this. Forget about energy efficiency. The thing is that you know, COVID might have highlighted this problem. It's now in our face. We can't not ignore it. But this problem has actually always been here. So even before we had CO2 sensors and before we had demand control ventilation 20 years ago or more than 10 years ago, our six air handling units, the outside dampers would modulate closed when not in economy down to a fixed position, say 20% open, that fixed position was our design outside air. So forever, every Saturday, when floors start up in after hours mode, we are oversupplying outside air forever. Saturday comes along, there's 15 floors, only two start up, they open up, the six AHU start up, and they draw in design outside air. So forever, we have been massively unnecessarily oversupplying outside air and wasting energy. And that's just, whether you care about energy efficiency or not, that's just not acceptable. That's like, if you've watched all of our videos for the last 18 months, there's a lot of things on this list that we don't do very well. And that's not, that's not great. And I think a part of the problem currently is this. When I worked for BMS companies, when I was a design engineer, I was 40 hour a week specialist BMS design engineer. Somebody else on our project team was the project manager, specialist in project management. And then there was the software programmer, specialist in software programming. The three of us, plus commissioning, blah, 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 made up the team. Nowadays, this next generation of controls companies don't tend to have a dedicated design engineer and project manager. We won't go into that. But what's actually happening is young people are joining BMS companies and they're getting training on the BMS product, how to write software code, how to upload and download controllers, how to build database graphics, alarms and trends, you know, how to you know, drag a PID loop onto the screen, connect it to a process variable, connect it to an output, connect in the set point, the interlock, you know, sequencing modules, timer modules, rate limiter modules. We're teaching these, the next generation of engineers, the software coding. But they are also the design engineer and they're also the project manager. Although they're not getting trained on those two things 
and they don't have 20 years experience to have been promoted into those more sort of senior roles. So right now, our BMS engineers, and with respect to all of you on this call, our BMS engineers nowadays, a lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time, our BMS engineers really are trained software programmers. And this is a bit of a problem. So often I get engaged to go to site and solve controls problems. And always what happens is I read the functional description, the control sequence before I go, I read through it, there's a problem. In the words, there's the problem. I go to site, I meet the BMS engineer, we sit down there and I say, okay, let's go through this. And I do like a witness session in an existing building. This is not witnessing, this is you know 10 year old building. And I say, okay, do this, do this. And we go through and we prove that the software code is correct to the wrong design. That happens all of the time because we don't have trained design engineers anymore. Now we have a software programmer who has been asked to do the design and project management, which they don't know a lot about. So this is a key issue. So why I'm telling you this, Brass, this is unrelated, it's related. I'm telling you this because if you listen to this video, we're talking about a problem that's been around forever. We didn't work it out. And now it's become a big problem with demand control ventilation and the current situation of people working from home and we're not working these things out. We're not, we're not working out these problems. So does that make sense? I guess I'm saying it and I can, it's not always in my head. Um, let me um, think another way of saying this. All right, how about this? Let's say you learn to drive a car, all right? You have a, you have a driving lesson, so you're in the car, clutch in, first gear, clutch comes out, accelerator, you pull away, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, you're driving along, indicate, turn. So you have been taught how to drive the car. You can get from A to B, you know how to use the controls of the car, gear lever, pedals, indicators, lights, wiper, how to put petrol in. You know, you know how to, to use the car. That doesn't mean you're a great car driver. It doesn't mean that you can now go and enter into a car race. And that's what's happening now. BMS engineers, software programmers, are being trained to use the tool. The gear levers, the pedals, the tool. You're learning how to software program the tool. Database, graphics, alarms, trends, how to you know, build a server, integrations, HLI. You're learning the tools of our trade. But you're not learning how to drive the car very well. You're not, we're not learning how to do design and project management. Uh, I think that's it. Have a think about that. Um, that last bit doesn't make sense. Um, hope so. Have a good week. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you.